Great to be here. Uh, I, I should confess up front that uh, Phil and I have been friends for a very long time. I actually looked it up um, on Google and it turns out that when I met Phil, 90% of the people in the world had not yet been born. <laughs> so it's, so it's something about both of our hairlines. Uh, and, and for those of you who don't know, uh, the Conservation Law Foundation, it, it, we went through that kind of quickly here, but, but that is part of some serious street tread. If you were to take the Washington Environmental Council and the Oregon Environmental Council and the Idaho Conservation League, merge them all together and double their resources, that's sort of the Conservation Law Foundation in New England. So, uh, I, I think it's safe to say that we've got a, a serious player here. And in addition to leading the leading uh, environmental group in Israel, he also helped design the first environmental legislation ever for the Palestinian Authority. So Phil, uh, first environmental legislation for them. So Phil is, is a guy who has been in the trenches for a very long time, has a lot of wisdom, and I'm thrilled and delighted to spend time with him. But the warning from all of that was mostly that if you came expecting to see William Buckley taking on Gloria Vidal, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a little bit friendlier than that, but, it, but, but I'll still see if I can trip him up every now and then. <laughs> so, Phil, your solar journey begins in your own home in cold, snowy Massachusetts. How's that worked out for you? I mean, do you have to go up in the winter and brush the snow off of your solar collectors? Well, we installed our, our solar system in March of 2013, and it was actually two days after a classic New England snowstorm, and I expected that the crew wouldn't show up at all. Um, they did show up, and one of the crew members was a guy named Liam Madden. He was a burly guy. He'd been an Iraqi war veteran. He'd served in a Marine expeditionary unit, and he looked up at our roof, which has a 55-degree slope, and I saw him <laughs> blanch. And I asked him, I said, have you ever installed on a roof this steep before? And he kind of shook his head. So they attached their ropes from the peak of the roof. And um, at the end of a harrowing day, our system was in place. We now get 75% of our total power needs from the sun. And that includes charging our plug-in electric hybrid vehicle mm -hmm. every night. So we're doing pretty well. I think one of the reasons we're doing so well is a somewhat counterintuitive one for people who aren't very familiar with pho photovoltaics. They actually work better in colder weather. So as long as they're not covered with snow, which they are sometimes in New England, um, we produce lots and lots of solar energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I didn't realize how steep your roof was when I asked that question, but you're, you're, you're better off than most. So you, you chased all over the country. You met with dozens and dozens of people asking them the kinds of questions that I think everybody in the audience would ask if they were curious about this issue. Uh, what are a couple of the most interesting, surprising things that you encountered? I think you know, we're all accustomed to thinking of renewable energy as a progressive issue, part of the panoply of measures that we need to take to get to a more sustainable energy future. And so one would expect progressive politicians to support solar energy. So I'm very happy that former Congressman Henry Waxman wrote a blurb on the back of my book. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, but predictable. <laughs> um, less predictable. That was not the quote. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Thank goodness. Um, a, a lot less predictable is that uh, people like former Congressman Barry Goldwater uh, was a congressman from California, then headed up a group, still as the chair of a group called Tusk, Tell Utilities Solar Won't Be Killed. And it's a very kind of libertarian in perspective group that is basically saying that homeowners and businesses have a right to generate their own solar energy, should be able to kind of fight off the giant utility monopolies, and should be compensated for their uh, excess solar power by their utility. Um, People like that are among the surprises. I can tell you about a mayor in California, if you'd like, as well, who, um, a guy named Rex Paris. There's a town in uh, California called Lancaster. It has about 160,000 inhabitants. Um, it was known as a gang warfare center for many years, until 2008, when Rex Paris, a right-wing Republican law and order guy, former class action litigator, was elected mayor, and he was elected on a uh, crime-fighting platform. And he very proudly told me that he had put 
20,000 suspected gang members behind bars during his first years in office. I have to say, I am adding suspected. He did not say suspected. Um, and a tough guy, and as he said to me, if you join a gang, the Constitution just doesn't apply to you. Um, so that kind of hard-nosed political perspective, fortunately, he also brings to address the climate change issue, and he deplores the fact that fellow Republicans have decided that climate change is an issue that is off-bounds. Um, he feels it is a very real issue, and when he was in China several years ago, he stood up before a group of esteemed diplomats and said, I just want to tell you about my city, Lancaster, California, because it's going to be the solar capital of the world. Hmm. He came back to uh, Lancaster and went about getting solar installed on all public buildings. There's now a code in place in Lancaster that requires that every residential, new residential unit either have solar on it or have off-site solar that gives power to, to that unit. Um, and his projection is that through those measures and other measures, including utility-scale development, uh, Lancaster will be a net solar energy producer and exporter within the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, it, 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 it's sort of part of the great tradition in America where you, you are able to make uh, coalitions of convenience without necessarily agreeing on everything. As I think a great many of us who were thrilled and delighted with the Pope's comments on climate suddenly discovered this morning that our, our views did not find themselves in perfect alignment on all issues. Uh, so there, there are lots and lots of polls out there. One was released today by the Sierra Club showing that a vast percentage of Americans choose solar as their favorite energy source, followed by wind, followed by conservation, and then you get down into the things that have kinds of trivial followings. But solar is pretty vague. Uh, it can be in heliostats covering the desert. It can mean photovoltaic arrays on your roof. It can mean little ranking cycle engines with concentrators in people's backyards or swimming pool heaters. Or uh, as, as you look at the array of things that would fall within that banner of solar, do you have, having looked at this all pretty carefully now for a while, some sense of which ones you'd bet on as the long-term winners? I think so, photovoltaics and specifically um, uh, crystalline silicon photovoltaics are certainly the most promising technology here and now. Uh, one very interesting indicator of where solar energy is today is the first six months of this year. If you look at newly installed electric generating capacity during that period, 39% of it came from solar and the vast majority of that was from photovoltaics. Um, 35%, sorry, 36% came from wind. So together, you have renewable resources generating three quarters of the new capacity during the first six months of this year. You know, we all think of gas as the, the easy way to go, not from an environmental perspective, but we've got cheap fracked gas, so let's build lots of gas turbines and you know, we'll worry about the environment somewhere down the road. Um, gas amounted to about 21% of new installed capacity during this period, so I think that's a promising sign. New technologies are coming and we can get into, you know, where some of those technologies are going, but. Yeah. No, I mean, we tend to focus a lot upon the technology and upon the economics, but in the end, uh, being able to create something that doesn't have broad public opposition, as you have for most kinds of power sources today, uh, is, is just an enormous asset out in that field. Uh, and we should explore that a little bit with regard to some solar technologies as well. But first, an, an easier one in terms of it, I think. Uh, you, you've been a big fan of developing brown fields, which, it, you know, you're not going to put a playground in a ground field, you're going to put a hospital in a ground field, but, but putting solar out in brown fields. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, the US EPA has a um, division called Repowering America's Land, and that division has looked at America's brownfield resources, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the term brownfields, it sort of means what it sounds like it means. It's contaminated or potentially contaminated properties. They might have been former mining areas, former factories, landfills, and the like. EPA surveyed more than 100,000 of these sites, and it estimates that from those sites, we could be generating about three times our total power needs from the sun. 
Um, now, that isn't to say that it would be economically expedient to go that route right now, but we are seeing a lot of these brownfield sites developed. And I think of Hanford, Washington. I haven't, frankly, been out there, but I would imagine that you have some pretty substantial brownfield sites that one might want to consider converting to solar because there probably aren't too many other terribly desirable uses for those kinds of properties. Um, one of those properties that I visited was in um, the West Pullman neighborhood of Chicago, on the south side, very crime-ridden area. Um, International Harvester uh, built a plant there and was assembling uh, farm machinery there for many decades. It closed the factory in the early 80s. The facility lay dormant and it was a very, very contaminated site. Exelon came in in 2009, built what's called Exelon City Solar, uh, which now generates enough electricity for about 1,500 households. Um, I wish I could say that it had solved the crime problems on the south side. Unfortunately, the major source of breakage at that facility is stray bullets falling from the sky. Um, that said, uh, what was an environmental hazard, a health hazard, and a visual blight is now a very productive, environmentally responsible, economically advantageous facility. There are lots of other facilities like that around the country. And then uh, greenfields. I mean, th th there is real controversy, particularly within environmental ranks, of going into some natural areas, some of which are not traditionally green as the color, but they are desert scapes that have enormous emotional appeal to people and their own unique biodiversity attached to them. And they also are um, typically incredibly sunny and uh, rich in uh, potential to develop as solar. But how, how do you feel about the, the greenfield development? I think we're at a point in our history where we really have to develop everything we can that is clean and renewable. And ideally, we want to focus first on our built environment. Uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which you once headed, um, has estimated that we could be getting about a fifth of our total power needs from rooftop solar alone. So that's a great place to start. But if we want to push the frontiers of solar beyond that, and I think you and I probably both want to push the frontiers of solar well beyond that. Uh, I think we have to look outside our built environment and green fields offer a great opportunity. Um, one facility I visited is called the California Valley Solar Ranch. It's on the Carrizo Plain in San Luis Obispo County, California. Uh, it's an area that was partially farmed, but it also has some very distinctive wildlife values. Uh, some refer to that area as California's Serengeti, which is a bit generous, but there are um, some very valued creatures such as the San Joaquin kit fox, the giant kangaroo rat. I have to admit I knew nothing about either of those species before I went to this facility. But SunPower, which is the corporation that developed this facility, um, took great pains to relocate these species from the construction site during construction and has allowed them to re-inhabit the site post-construction. They also created migratory corridors for elk and antelope through the fields, and they set aside 12,000 acres as permanent conservation lands. So that's a great example of a company that has really gone above and beyond to protect natural resources while building a facility that on 1,400 acres of solar panels generates enough electricity for about 100,000 households. Um, I think we need to put our use of green fields in perspective in terms of just how much we have let, frankly, farmers get away with and ranchers get away with in contaminating our lands and in misusing our lands. And while we really do need to be vigilant, I think, in how we go about developing solar power on green fields, I think we also have to be cognizant of just how huge a resource we have in our open lands and how badly we have mucked them up. And I'd be curious for you to just say a few <laughs> words about coming. your recent book, yeah. Cowed, because you've looked very closely at ranching practices mm -hmm. and what has happened in that regard. Yeah, um, well, this, this is all about harnessing the sun, but uh, another uh, volume out there, which some of you I recognize from the crowd were here when we did our presentation on Cowed as well, does talk about other competing uses for land. And, and in fact, we would like to see far more land used for cattle grazing and particularly for bison. Uh, 
um, in, in ways that uh, the plants that are grown on them are the plants that have always grown on them, the grasses and the forbs that we have no other purpose for except ungulates to eat. And, and with many of those, it would be possible to, I, I think, come up with something where you were co-using it uh, easily for wind and potentially uh, for solar as well. Um, but getting, getting back to you rather than me, uh, you were talking about the, the roofs of buildings and distributed energy. Uh, of course, it's possible to harvest, economics be damned for just a minute, but it's possible to harvest uh, energy off of the south wall, the east wall, the west wall of buildings, as well as um, to take those NREL numbers and say, okay, but what if we started orienting all of our new buildings correctly and having roofs with the right angles on them and solar access laws so that when you were building something and putting solar on it, your neighbor wouldn't be shading it and just giving you the most expensive roof in the neighborhood, but that doesn't do anything for you. If, if, if you're thinking about this in the time frame that you think about a, a real energy transition of 25, 30, 40 years, the built environment turns over every 40 to 50 years. Uh, how much do you think it might be possible, or do you even have any hunches about this, to, to actually get from a distributed fashion? If we got serious about this, and as a society started mm -hmm. moving there aggressively. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a very good point that housing and other building stock turns over, because what we're seeing right now is that about between 22 and 27 percent of domestic roofs are solar suitable, and between 60 and 65 percent of commercial roofs are appropriate for solar. Uh, and you could say, well, that is a limiting factor, but as you're saying, that limiting factor could change significantly going forward. Um, and I think it also ta speaks to technological innovation. We're hearing about roof tiles, building integrated roof tiles that would be f photovoltaic. We're hearing about uh, windows that could incorporate photovoltaic technology. We're hearing about much improved efficiency of various solar cells. So I think we can expect to see that one-fifth of our total power needs going up very substantially because of those kinds of technological changes and because of, well, because of, if we institute the right regulations so that people build new buildings with the appropriate orientation, which is not by any means a given. And just one anecdote in that regard. Um, one of the quirkier places I investigated solar was at uh, football stadiums, uh, where they're frankly more symbolic than anything else, but the person who took me through uh, the Gillette Stadium in uh, New England uh, was from Houston, Texas. And I asked him what I thought was going to be a perfunctory question, which was, do you have solar on your home? And he said, actually, I don't, because my homeowners association prohibits it. And um, I was recently on Dallas Public Radio, and I told this story, and they had their researcher quickly go online, it turned out that as of September 1, the governor signed a law that requires all buildings within, I think, any homeowners association with more than 50 units now has to adopt <laughs> solar, so, or has to be open to solar. So, um, we do need to see those kinds of reforms, um, and um, the potential is really quite substantial. Now, we, we've seen a lot of industries that have been changed dramatically in, in recent years, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, sometimes with mixed results. We have uh, a few disruptors here in Seattle who've changed some industries fairly profoundly. Um, one of the most conservative uh, stick-in-the-mud industries as a whole has been the utility industry, and yet if you're going to be having distributed power that is surfacing anything other than the building that it is on top of, you've got to have something that distributes uh, do, you, do you have some ideas about, one, are, is there a role for utilities to play in the generation of distributed power? And two, what, what do you see as the perfect role of utilities looking again forward a decade or two yeah. in the future? Well, I think we're at a very interesting transformational moment for utilities because traditionally the job of utilities has been to generate electricity and sell it. And that's a very narrowly defined role. And it worked pretty well when we were getting all of our power from a coal plant or a nuclear plant where you basically turn a plant on in one moment and 40 or 50 or 60 years later, you, if nothing disastrous has happened, you turn it off. Um, solar obviously has natural variations 
by the day, by the season, same thing with wind. Um, we've got to get much smarter about how we think about electricity generation, storage, and use. And utilities have really got to wake up to that challenge. And it's a little like the, the Kodaks and the Polaroids of this world who just did not wake up to the digital era until it was too late. Um, utilities really have to become energy services providers and not just power producers. And there are some interesting iconoclasts within the utility sector. Uh, David Crane of NRG Energy is certainly one of them, um, who are very candid in saying that the utility sector really has to utterly transform itself or go under. And mm -hmm. I think we're going to see some real struggles. We're already seeing some struggles where utilities do not like distributed solar generation. They want to control the show. Yeah. So I think there's going to have to be utility involvement in energy storage and smart use of demand resources um, that utilities are engaged in. And we're going to see a very, very different looking and feeling utility, I think, 20 and 30 years from now. Now, David Crane is arguably, uh, certainly in terms of his statements and probably in terms of most of his policies, uh, the, the archetype of uh, enlightened utility executive. I mean, if, if you ask anybody in the field, who's your favorite utility CEO, it's David Crane. Uh, the stock price of energy has declined by almost 65% over the last 12 months, so Wall Street isn't feeling quite the same way about this transition. Do you think that this is one of those things where, uh, is this a buying opportunity for those of us that <laughs> share your view of the future? I'm not in the business of giving uh, stock advice. <laughs> um, but I, I think one of the things that's happening right now with the solar industry is that it is facing huge uncertainty because of the potential lack of continuity of key government policies. Um, we're very accustomed to thinking of oil and gas and nuclear as getting substantial federal subsidies and in many cases state subsidies over decades. What we've seen happen with wind and what we're seeing happen with solar is that uh, incentives that are provided today are by no means guaranteed tomorrow. So there's a federal investment tax credit a 30% tax credit that applies to homes, that applies to businesses, that applies to utilities. It will expire for homes um, as of the end of 2016, and it will go down from 30% to 10% for businesses and for utility-scale solar um, as of that year. That's a huge hit to the industry. And we're seeing other solar policies at the state level threatened with sunsetting. And I think that um, you can't run, um, a, for example, a manufacturing sector based upon that kind of uh, unreliability. You need to know 10, 15 years out what you're going to be able to produce in order to make it worth your while to build a factory. Mm -hmm. um, same thing is applying with um, solar developers. There is no utility scale solar developer today who is not thinking about that end of 2016 fundamental change in the tax structure. And so I think we all have to work to uh, press our political representatives to provide the kind of continuity for solar that we have taken for granted for various other energy technologies for so very long. Yeah, for very long. It's not just decades. In some, it's, it's more than a century. Right. Uh, and they, they enacted some of them in ways that are now difficult to replicate, uh, carrying sacks full of money in brown paper bags from, from Houston to Washington, D.C. that was part of the Sam Rayburn, Lyndon Johnson thing. Um, and and uh, a little personal thing, something that is almost known by nobody, not that anybody cares about me in terms of my background. I've, I was for a brief period of time the, uh, the so-called consumer member on the National Petroleum Council, which would be 60 of the largest CEOs of oil companies in the United States plus me. And, uh, and in the course of that, I would get into these casual conversations with people and express my naivete and say, could you please explain to me what intangible drilling cost write-offs mean? And literally nobody could. I mean, it was just money in their pocket. There was no rationale for this whatsoever, but it's like, why in the world do you have a depletion allowance instead of a depletion tax? It's just a wacko set of ways we've set up. So if, if we're going to be getting a solar future, presumably we ought to have the inverse of that. We ought to be not trying to say, how can we get an even playing field with oil and coal? It's how do we get a gigantic advantage on that playing field that causes us to really 
expand explosive thing. That's fair. Um, By the way, they called it intangible for the reason you said. Yeah. It's quite intangible. <laughs> yeah, although it uh, fills up a lot of bank accounts. Uh, a lot of the most successful business models, successful in the sense of really getting equipment out onto rooftops and stuff, have um, involved people renting solar equipment, uh, simply renting their rooftops to somebody that puts solar equipment on it and getting various kinds of financial deals or power deals versus just what you do, uh, buying it and having mm -hmm. it installed and mm -hmm. owning it. Uh, do you have any hunches about what model, assuming that there is going to be a dominant model going forward, what model will triumph? amid all this competition? Well, the dominant, dominant model right now actually is the third party power purchase agreement, mm -hmm. um, which is um, a great advantage to homeowners who don't want to foot the full bill for installing a solar array on their home, but they want that home generated solar power. So a company will come in and offer to install a solar array and then give you a set price that you will be paying per kilowatt hour for the power generated by that, that solar array. Um, 72% of all newly installed um, solar is via that arrangement today. There are also lease arrangements that um, allow you to um, lease the solar equipment and then you get all of the power generated by that equipment. I think those are wonderful ways to broaden the um, demographics of those who can enjoy solar power. Mm -hmm. I think there's another though step that, that is just beginning to be taken that we need to encourage and that is low-income solar? How do we really reach into low-income communities and provide them with what is really an economic benefit? It also happens to be a significant environmental benefit, but California is taking the lead in this respect, as in many respects regarding solar. They have about $300 million allocated for low-income solar development on housing, and they use a nonprofit entity called Grid Alternatives that in turn relies upon volunteer crews to come into homes, uh, install solar, and give people basically a wonderful gift, which is that they end up without electric, electric bills to pay over the next several decades. And people who would have a very difficult time, if not having an impossible time, getting access to the capital to do that. Absolutely. And would be paying really high rates of interest if they ever could get access to the right one. Um, when you discuss solar as a fraction of energy use, of course, an important part of the fraction, we focused on the numerator, but an important part is the denominator. Uh, there were some things that you've said over time that led me to think that you, you have some skepticism about some parts of that denominator that some of us have, have thought of as being very attractive. Ways that uh, solar and electrification of the economy might well be exploding in the future with uh, autonomous electrified vehicles, um, maybe replacing a lot of aircraft with high-speed electrified trains, um, uh, just uh, all of the data centers and things that are part of the digital revolution. It, we, we talk about um, Skyping instead of taking the car, and that will save a lot of energy, but it's also going to be using a lot of electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are you thinking about the denominator going forward? Are we going to be replacing um, pretty much energy use as we have it in this country with electricity? I think that um, it's part of human nature to translate the possible into the inevitable. And that worries me very much because on, we can look at the supply side of the equation and say, look at what solar power can do. Look at what wind power can do. Uh, and as you say, then we have to look at, well, okay, but what percentage of the whole will that be? And if that whole grows and grows, then we're not necessarily in a very much better position 50 years from now than we are today. And I think the self-driving car is an example of a technology that certainly has interesting and innovative appli applications. Um, they will be huge data consumers, and we already know that the, one of the major new energy consumers are these giant data centers because everyone from my daughters who take multiple pictures per day for Instagram or whatever it might be to you know, potentially these self-driving cars, um, demand lots and lots of data, and those data centers uh, are a wild card. And there are certainly some other wild cards. Population growth is another um, significant contributor, as much as we'd like to think that one can um, 
have a larger population that would be a more sustainable population. The reality is more people mean more energy consumed. And um, so I think we have to really focus as much on managing our use of energy as we do on producing the right kinds of electricity. In terms of producing the right kind, if you were you know, using your judgment to guess uh, 25 years from now, uh, 2040, how would you guess it's most likely, not, not what would you like to see, but what do you think if everything goes as well as you think is plausible? Uh, and we will even throw over a couple of turnovers of Congress in the course of this, and, and, and a president who is genuinely committed to things that a great many have given lip service to. But, but, but still, within practical reality, how would you see in the optimum likely world energy distribution, but by source in, say, 2040? Um, in the optimum world, as opposed to um, what I really think will happen, in the optimum world, I think we could easily be getting half of our total power supply from wind and solar. Right now, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory projects that using technology that is commercially available today, we could be generating about half of our total power needs. Um, so if that's the case using currently available technology, then we have to look at what are the innovations that are really on the cusp of being commercializable that could boost that number very substantially. Um, I think that's certainly feasible. I think we need a degree of political enlightenment that we do not yet find across both aisles in Congress. Uh, we certainly need that enlightenment at the state level as well and at the local level. So um, I'd rather talk about what I think is possible mm -hmm. than uh, get depressed by talking about what I think is probable. <laughs> good. Um, but we are, we are all in search of hope, so that's a, a good stance to take. <laughs> But um, in, in some places, and this will be unpopular with parts of the crowd, but bear with me, we're having a dialogue. Uh, there, there has been a, a genuine technological preemption that has taken place without massive political organization or social movements or something. Like that. You, you needed to have some antitrust rulings that made AT&T vulnerable. Uh, you needed to have some fundamentally different approaches to the way that businesses saw computation to make IBM vulnerable. But we took a couple of the most powerful entities in the United States and turned them into fragile shells of what they used to be just by having superior technology. I think that's something that can, I mean, let, let's say that you're doubling the efficiency of your solar panels. And over 25 years, you are doubling the amount of roof area that's available to do them. Mm -hmm. Is this, without the government really having to do too much, could you? be even more hopeful? <laughs> um, well, I want to ask you, you've designed one of the really cutting edge buildings here in Seattle. And so in a you sense, <laughs> you've designed the most cutting edge building in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think is the art of the possible in terms of, of going forward? You know, it's really weird. I, I, I should not, this is your show, but I, I am one of the world's classic pessimists. I, I can with almost any audience that you choose, get 100% of them interested in committing seppuku in merely 10 minutes of talking. But on this, I think, I, I, I think I'm actually a bit more optimistic than you are. I, I really do think that the doubling of efficiency is not only possible, but it's likely. We can certainly do it in the labs, and there's no reason that it can't get out there commercially, with only a modest increase in the cost. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you're doubling the efficiency, I, I, I think we can move pretty quickly, not to half of our power, but to two-thirds and more of our total energy use coming out of distributed. The, the downside of that is, not, not downside in the sense of being a disadvantage, the, the reason to be pessimistic about it is that when you really start quantifying what needs to be done in terms of building new factories to produce that much, it is an awesome undertaking. Um, the, the quick version just to give you a taste of what I could do in 10 minutes if we really went into the pessimistic part. I, 10 years ago, we did a, a series of back-of-the-envelope sketches to say, what would it take to produce all of the energy used on the planet in uh, the year 2000? Um, if we were to get that much energy produced from solar photovoltaics by 2050, 
And it turns out that, that at that time there were two factories on Earth that produced a gigawatt of PV. That's to say, in, in one year they produced enough panels that if you took all of those panels, lay them in the sunshine at noon on a sunny day, they would produce as much energy as a nuclear power plant. So you view of that as a, a one gigawatt factory. There were two of them. If we, if we set up a new gigawatt factory every day from the year 2000 to 2050 and use their cumulative production, it would not produce enough electricity to supplant all of the energy used in the world in 2000. So it is, it's a doable, yeah, but it's a mobilization akin to World War II and it goes on for five decades and mm -hmm. it's a massive deployment of resources. And it's not something that'll be done by neoliberal economics, it'll be done by the good side of Pope Francis by saying there is good and there is bad. There's, uh, it, if, if we have a moral responsibility of stewards of the earth, then we have to act this way to fulfill that stewardship. Well, I think the, um, the World War II analogy is actually a good one in that we are facing a global threat, climate change, and I think it is worthy of that kind of mobilization. So just as we really could mobilize resources that were unprecedented to uh, fight World War II, um, we certainly could mobilize those resources if there were sufficient awareness and sufficient uh, motivation. And I think what we're finding with Pope Francis and others is that um, the acceptance of climate change as a very serious challenge that we need to address is more and more per pervasive. And we're even seeing renegades within the Republican camp acknowledging that you know, this is something that we really need to address. So I, I am optimistic that we can transform the way that we relate to the challenge. Whether we can gear up our industrial sector to produce sufficient technology is another question. And I think a sub-question there actually is, what is the energy that we're using to produce the photovoltaic, let's say, technology? One of the challenges today is that um, about 85% of our uh, solar panels come out of Asia a lot of those panels are made by burning dirty coal. So if you're producing a panel in Washington where the majority of the electricity is hydroelectricity, it's a very different story in terms of its carbon footprint than if you're producing that panel in China. Um, so I think we have to really build transformation of the manufacturing process into the process, into the uh, transformation of our overall electricity infrastructure. And it's a great example of, of mobilization in general. When, when Germany set up its feet in Terep, um, China was making solar water heaters. It wasn't making photovoltaic panels at all. That's 12 years ago. And they're now producing 60% of all the solar panels, solar photovoltaic panels in the world. They committed themselves to doing it. And they're selling half of them domestically. So that, yeah, right. that, that's the kind of mobilization we're talking for as a first step. Uh, we're getting toward the point where the wonderful people who've been sitting uh, patiently in the audience, but I'm sure like to get into it. Let me throw two quick final questions at you. You have uh, addressed this first one a couple times already, but I'd, I'd like to throw it in to have you focus directly on it instead of as an offshoot. Uh, we've talked about the right policies as a precondition to this. As you've looked across the country, uh, in addition to the things one might do nationally, you, you've looked at a lot of cities and a lot of states and you are in a very progressive city and a state with a governor who is really trying to be out front on this. Do you have any recommendations for what we should do in Seattle and what we should do in Washington? Well, Washington's in an interesting kind of challenging situation because your power is actually very cheap. You're paying eight to nine cents per kilowatt hour. In Massachusetts, we are both, we have the fortune and misfortune of paying almost twice that amount for our electricity. So it makes it easier to sell distributed solar generation because that's what we're competing against. Um, I think that the policies that are in place here that um, uh, provide for renewable energy production uh, incentive payments um, is, a, is a very enlightened one. Um, it's now discretionary, it's not mandatory. So making that mandatory could be a very positive step in terms of really pushing toward the next frontier here in terms of renewable energy. Um, certainly continuity with the federal tax credit that I talked about. Um, 30 states plus the District of Columbia have what are called renewable portfolio standards, uh, which require that a certain minimum amount of utilities generated power and distributed power um, be produced from renewable sources. 
Um, that has proven to be a very powerful motivator in getting uh, the solar industry going and getting the wind industry going. So um, there are still a good number of states who have not gone that route. That would be a very important step to take. And I think solar net metering is also a very important step where people can be guaranteed that even when they're not using the power they're generating, there is a market for that power in selling it back to, to their utilities. No, we, we have a renewable energy portfolio, but it is way too modest and it doesn't have a solar carve out. Yeah. There are lots of ways we could tweak that. I, th I think we've covered everything that I wanted to cover here. Why don't we turn this over to the audience? I, we have representatives of the Solar Energy Association of Washington here and solar entrepreneurs here and a couple of professors here, and I suspect this will be the stimulating part of the program. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Ann Engstrom. I run the Citizen Climate Lobby in Seattle. And I have solar panels on my house. And I, the first ones I put in in 2011 with Pam and Jeremy. And, <coughs> and I put in a second section on my roof. And I have an electric car, a charger. I've done all of those things. Today in the mail I got from the City Light, they're reducing our incentive by 30%. That makes me quite upset because um, I thought I was going to be able to get those paid by 2020 and that I was guaranteed that. And now they're coming out to reduce that payment. So um, do you have any ideas on how to deal with that? Make a lot of noise. <laughs> uh, and not just in this room. I mean, clearly that kind of the continuity that you expected is the kind of continuity that is going to get people to be willing to invest in solar, whether you're a homeowner or whether you're a, a business. And um, the, the disillusionment that you feel is certainly not going to help the solar industry move forward. So I think that um, a major presence on your capital, I want to say hill, I don't know if it's on a hill or not, but in your state capital, um, would be very important in making sure that um, there is greater continuity than there is today. Well, I think when everybody finds out they're getting cut <laughs> and can't pay off their bills, I'm sure there will be some vocal. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm reasonably confident that Jeremy would be willing to share with you the names of the other people with whom he installed those panels. And if, if your voice is a collective one, we're, we're now moving, as you know, to district city council elections. So. Those are very accessible people. Show up and raise cane at the meetings. They're running for office right now and uh, make clear that you're gonna support the ones that are prepared to support you. And Seattle City Light is now in this interregnum uh, between uh, people running it. Uh, this is a good time for them to be vulnerable. I'm, I, I hadn't heard anything about this before this evening, but that sounds outrageous. And it's not something that you should do is at this inter, interim period at, at the utility. So raise cane. Hello. Um, I was reading a lot recently about Elon Musk and the work he's been doing in, with Tesla in particular. I was interested uh, what your thoughts were on, on that work that he's been doing and the impact it'll have down the road here with the um, kind of accept, the common acceptance of electric cars in the industry and how that kind of transforms the equation we're talking about as well. Um, Elon Musk is... Uh a visionary, he's kind of a maximalist. Uh, I personally don't think the Tesla is a great inspiration because it is such a high-end vehicle and I actually test drove a Tesla at my daughter's initiative and practically expired when I hit the accelerator. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, it's quite different from my Honda Civic Hybrid that takes 10 minutes to get onto the highway. Um, but. Uh, I think he is at least showing what electric technology can do. I think one of the interesting opportunities for electric vehicles actually, uh, and there are more practical electric vehicles, the car my wife drives is a Ford C-Max Energy, which is a plug-in electric hybrid, um, and she averages about 150 miles to the gallon on that car. It's a much more modest car. Um, one of the things that I think utilities can do, which is very important, uh, is to regard electric vehicles as battery storage resources. Musk is now talking about you know, the, the, the storage walls of batteries. They're single purpose storage entities. Um, if you have a car, I would bet that most of you don't drive more than an hour a day, and some of you probably drive a lot less than an hour a day. So that means that your car is sitting idle for 23 plus hours. 
that is a wonderful battery storage resource that a utility could be using to charge and decharge according to when renewable energy is available or not available, um, and uh, provide us with the kind of storage resource that we need to accompany a robust renewable energy infrastructure. So I think Musk is pointing us in the right direction. I happen to think that um, his kind of iconic vehicles are not necessarily the ones that are going to inspire a lot of people who can't really afford a car that's quite that expensive. I'm hoping the prices will come down as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, in fact, they, they, are, they have been promised that they will come down yeah. in 2017 with a 35 to $40,000 model. Right. Uh, People say they will become cheaper. I like to say they will be less expensive. Yes. That's probably true. <laughs> uh, a, a quick just comment on this. We, we focus when we talk about this energy sphere mostly on the price of solar modules, which is a really relatively small part of the overall scheme. Storage is a big part. With regard to, um, to vehicles, there's, there are a number of companies. One that I'm sort of familiar with, though less so than I was a year ago, locally is V2 Green, which uh, basically is producing the interface between the vehicle and the grid. And to oversimplify, it's basically if, if you are selling electricity for eight cents a kilowatt hour, I'm buying. If you're buying electricity for 12 cents a kilowatt hour, I'm selling and leave enough charge in my battery to let me go 40 miles tomorrow. And suddenly, automatically, without anybody doing anything except sticking in a plug, you've got a whole series of financial structures that are operating automatically and it's taking advantage of that vehicle as, as a storage battery. And there are lots of clever things to do. Uh, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the actual costs of solar, um, in particular, the building of, of all of these plants, um, the materials, the land that's going to be required. Silicon is one of the most commonly occurring minerals on Earth. Um, and uh, between the, the silicon and the metal framing, you're talking about um, very recyclable materials. Um, in fact, Europe is way ahead of us in this regard. Europe is now mandating the recycling of solar panels as part of its electronic waste law. Um, by 2018, 80% of all discarded panels must be recycled, uh, for example. Um, and in, in terms of the land issue, there's no question that solar is surface intensive. The question is, what are those surfaces? If they're brown fields, so much the better. If they're roofs, that's great. If they're walls, fine. Um, sometimes green fields would need to be used. Um, and again, I think what we have to do is look at the choices. California today, as of 2013, I, I looked for a more recent uh, number, I can't find it, but. As of 2013, California was still growing more than um, a quarter of a million acres of cotton. Highly water intensive. They also have thousands and thousands of acres of sod farms. You know, one can identify various inappropriate uses for land today that could be more appropriately used for solar. And so I think we have to be selective. We have to be sensitive to the, land, the um, wildlife values on some of those greenfield solar farms. Um, but I think we have to get serious and say this is part of the transformation. Major portions of Wyoming are devoted to mining coal. Um, you know, a huge amount of Appalachia has been destroyed through mountaintop removal mining. Um, very recently, uh, the president announced that up to 40 million uh, acres of the um, 40 million acres, I think it is, of the Gulf of Mexico is now open for oil and gas drilling. So, you know, let, we, we have to put these things in perspective, I think. Yeah, I'm sorry, because I was more interested in the actual manufacturing costs and building of the plants, and like you mentioned, we'll, have, we'll need so many of them to fulfill the needs. I mean, there's a trade off. Yes. Let me to take. Sure. sure. Uh, and, and for those that weren't able to hear, he was saying we'd like to focus more on the manufacturing, the costs of all of that, and, and the minerals that go into it. And you're right, you're, you're doping silicon crystals, and you need some things that are slightly less common than silicon in them, but, but not rare earths and not things that are in 
short supply. There are some technologies, if you still do cadmium telluride, then you need to have some safety concerns in both manufacturing and the ultimate recycling, but it's also valuable enough that you can run the recycling fairly well. There are trade-offs with any energy technology. I, I think with rare earths, you might be a little bit confused with wind power, which actually do so use some classic uh, rare earths in the turbines. But um, with solar, it's, it's really mostly a matter of making the decision to do it. A gigawatt solar factory is roughly the size of a large semiconductor fab. Uh, and it's, yeah, it, 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 it takes land, but it's, it's a football field size. It's not awesome. And if you compare that to anything else, if it's oil, it's gas, it's coal, it's nuclear, the land requirements for solar, for anything other than absorbing sunshine, are sort of trivial by comparison. Um, hi, you touched on this uh, briefly a couple questions ago, but it, it seems like a massive part of the problem is the storage problem and the transmission problem, which um, doesn't get much discussion because it basically doesn't exist at all today. Um, I mean, it's one thing to build a gigawatt capacity of solar panels, but we're going to need the equivalent however many gigawatt hours or whatever of storage capacity. and. Battery technology does not seem like it's, you know, looking at a big breakthrough anytime soon. Um, I mean, there's just the manufacturing cost, but that's a radically different business model for the utilities and regulatory and, and that whole bit. So I, I don't know if you could yeah. go a little further down that direction, because that seems like maybe that's the, the, the piece of the iceberg that's under the water. Uh, on this, and you know, we're we're looking at yeah. the, the piece that's sticking up and going, oh great, we can, we can get all the solar panels out there, but but, you know, I don't want my car supplying energy overnight and having it dead in the morning, right? Um, so that's maybe not not a good use for my car battery to be powering the grid overnight. Okay. Well, I first, it might be if your car takes three or four hours to charge, and there's a lot of flexibility in there in terms of when your utility might actually be drawing from that battery and when it might be charging it. But more broadly, one inspiring example to me in terms of complementarity, and that's what we really need. We need to think about how different energy technologies work with each other. Um, Denmark now generates 40% of its electricity from the wind. Uh, what it does is it is in a very kind of symbiotic relationship with Norway, which has a huge amount of hydropower. So when Denmark has a surplus amount of wind-generated electricity, it wheels that power to Norway, which uses it to pump water into pump storage reservoirs, which are then releasing the water when there's a need for electricity on the European grid. Um, we can use pump storage here as just one example. Battery storage is another. But really as important as storage is using energy in a smart way. And that is not simply charging and decharging an automobile battery. It has to do with everything from how your refrigerator operates in your home to how a um, commercial air conditioning system works where a utility can modulate the consumption of power based upon what is available on the grid. It requires a more, much more sophisticated grid, but we have that sophistication at hand and we could be developing that kind of an integrated infrastructure. And just one, one more point, and that is um, a broad regional grid that is drawing diverse renewable resources is very important. So um, while the sun may not be shining in California at 9 p.m., the wind might be blowing strong in Wyoming at that time. So you're getting complementarity between different renewable resources. Right. It, you know, I, I've got solar panels, too. I've had them since... Uh, six or seven. It was one, one of the first ones up, but you know, it just the sun doesn't shine here for six months. That's so we've got a, like a big storage problem. Let <laughs> me. Well, I, I want to take issue with that. Um, Germany, which is the world leader in installed solar capacity and solar generation, not it's worse. Uh, Germany gets 1,500 hours of sunlight per year. Seattle gets about 2,100 hours of sunlight per year. And if you look at Washington as a whole, you obviously have a major portion of the state that is actually semi-arid where you're getting loads of sunlight. So I really don't think that's a constraint in Washington. But it, it does I guess my point was it does require just a, a whole nother level of, of grid technology Absolutely. To, to be able to make those transfers that we just aren't, aren't set up to do right now. 
we, we need to undergo that transformation. Yeah. Let, let me just pump for one second my, my little building. Uh, six stories, uh, same roof area on a six-story building as a one-story building or a 50-story building. Six stories, we produced 160% as much electricity as we used, and it's an all-electric building other than daylighting and stuff. Yeah. And, and we managed to export net energy to the grid uh, for eight of the months of the year. There, there were four that we had to net import, but each of those four, we produced a lot of electricity, just not enough to meet all of our needs. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. There is winter, and there, there's also things that can happen, including the absolute dumbest thing that is out there is these folks who would try to moderate climate by injecting sulfates into the atmosphere, diminishing the availability of sunshine to run the solar equipment so you don't need to worry about climate change. But uh, we can work our way through most of that on the technology side. I'm even strangely far more optimistic today than I was even three years ago about batteries, including batteries for longer term storage, flow batteries and things. Uh, where, where the real problem is is in human institutions and in this case utilities. They are just tough as hell to change. But hopefully a lot of bright young kids are going to come out of college and move into positions and get, get that turned around too. Um, Anne over here mentioned uh, her dilemma, and it turns out all, her utility, Seattle City Light, is also in that dilemma because um, they committed to do community solar projects that are dependent on the same incentives. So we find ourselves with some um, formidable allies in this, uh, which, but it does bring up where are utilities in all of this in the future? And you use the word transformation, which I think is a great word. But contained in that, what, what do you see in that word transformation? How is this going to happen? Is there a time scale you're thinking of? Well, we're already seeing utilities, uh, for example, in the community solar area. Um, community solar is developed by private co-ops and by private companies. Utilities are getting into the game, too, because they see that as part of their future. Um, utilities are also wanting to become solar installers. So, you, you are seeing utilities begin to recognize the opportunities and create competition, some of it's welcome, some of it's not, with other entities that are trying to move solar forward. Um, what it will take is a lot of people like David Crane um, really pushing the frontiers of what utilities are doing today and hopefully being able to bring his or her shareholders along. One, one quick thing, Jeremy, it, it would be need to find out exactly what Seattle City Light has done and see if there's anything we can do to work with the mayor and the council and the executives to get that undercut. I, I think they may have done something here that they have no idea what a shitstorm they're unleashing. And we, let, let's, let's give them a heads up. Let's talk in the next few days. So I, I realize that you're not local, but are, are there, um, can you point us in the direction of resources, uh, informational resources that would allow us to do the equation uh, if we were considering putting solar panels on our house as to what the costs would be. You know, you mentioned the leasing or the um, purchasing of the power for the opportunity that, in, to install the panels on our houses. Which ones make most sense? Do any of them make sense given that power is cheap and how we, uh, how we put that all together? If I could sneak in one more also, I'm particularly interested in the denominator also, as you call it, the. Um, uh, energy consumption and, and conservation and smart distribution, as you're saying. Um, assuming we as a community and as a, as a people have the will, what sorts of things do we need, what, what sorts of laws or regulations or how do we move our elected representatives at, and what do we want to ask of them to put in place to allow us to more smartly use or reduce our usage of the precious resource whether it's solar or nuclear or anything else? Well, on the level of how you can get a responsible estimate of what you should be installing on your house, solar companies love to come by your home and um, give you a, an actual estimate, whether it be a power purchase agreement or a lease agreement or an outright purchase. Um, you need to invite a few of them to come by. My experience was that the first company that came by did a very good job of going on Google and identifying our neighbor's roof. Uh, so you want to make sure they're getting the right roof and you want to make sure that they are 
um, really looking carefully and honestly at what your own situation is in terms of shading, in terms of orientation. Um, and uh, you don't need to go to an outside resource because there are entrepreneurs who are very happy to come in and under one circumstance or another install solar power on your, on your roof. And what about conservation and government policy? Do you want to take that one? <laughs> um, the, the remarkable thing in conservation is we've been preaching it now for 35 years. There's an enormous amount of information from a Google search. We, we, we've pushed it about as far as we were able to think of to do it in designing a building from scratch with the Bullet Center. And I, I, I was sitting there today with a, a group of people from the Philippines and from Australia that had come up in, in part to tour it. Uh, and they were asking about this and that. And it was very clear as we went through the various elements that we did. If you would ask the question, how can you do this using the least amount of energy, it was kind of obvious what the answer would be. And all we did was mostly the easy things. If, if, if you do have the opportunity to design from scratch, uh, the, the concept of putting your Venetian blinds outside the building instead of inside the building stops the sun from coming through and warming things up inside when you're trying to stop it. Uh, so this summer we had by far the most comfortable office building in the city because the sun never came in and because we opened all the windows from the second floor through the sixth floor at nine o'clock at night and flushed out all the hot air cool down the concrete floors overnight. I mean, that's not rocket science. You, you, you've got a diurnal cycle and it gives you some sunshine in the day and some cool at night and you take advantage of both to moderate the temperatures in your building. And on the very hottest days, we circulated a little bit of water uh, from our geothermal wells, cold water, up through the floors. And those simple things kept us so that when you're standing next to our windows, since the windows are triple paned, heat mirror, argon filled, a little bit more expensive than a single glass window to be sure, but really paying for themselves in terms of energy savings. You're not baking as you are in a downtown skyscraper if you get within 10 feet of the window. And if you walk 10 feet away from the window, you're not freezing the way that you are with a constant Arctic blast from the air conditioners. The whole thing is comfortable inside. And on average, we used one eighth the amount of electricity as the buildings downtown did per square foot of interior space. And it, it, the simple answer is just think carefully about what you're doing. I mean, you mentioned refrigerators. It's just, it's just, you're sort of a flood in information. If you're going to buy a refrigerator, all you have to do is ask the question, what's the most efficient one out there that meets my needs? And you're not going to want a little tiny one if you've got five people in your family. But, but get one that will genuinely meet all of your needs. And it turns out that from the best to the worst, it's, it's a factor of more than two in difference in consumption. And the worst today is three times as good as the best was 10 years ago. And, and what did that? Okay, they've got more insulation in it, right? They've got a more efficient compressor in it. They've got better seals around the door. Somebody asked the question, how can we use less electricity? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty obvious. And th this is, I, I, I don't mean to be dismissive of this at all. It's just, it, it's a matter of saying, this is important to me. And if it's important to you, you'll be stunned by how much savings you can have without any reduction in comfort or productivity or anything else. I think. We hit the end. Uh, I, I, I have actually read Phil's book from cover to cover. This is a fabulous book. If you could take off for a year and go around interviewing the most interesting people in the United States that have something to say about it and ask them the questions that are on your mind, it's what he did. And he's got their answers there, and it's really engagingly written, and I strongly encourage all of you to, to, to buy it.